All right, let's continue. All right. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, so what we what we found here is that um, uh, if we if we look at uh, the phase function for this dipole scatterer. Uh, that was exactly the phase function that we uh, also found uh, earlier on, as as, uh, as one of you already mentioned, for uh, for radius scattering, for the scattering by small particles. Uh, and uh, if you remember, uh, or if you look back in the slides, uh, there was an expression for the scattering cross section there as well that uh, uh, that uh, looked an awfully lot like the one that we have here, uh, with that difference that uh, that alpha was a, a little bit worked out, but uh, otherwise it was the same as well. Uh, so basically. Uh, what we conclude, can conclude is that uh, that uh, dipole scattering and scattering by very small particles, so very small compared to the wavelength, are equivalent. They uh, they are described by the same uh, formalism. Uh, and of course, the dipole is uh, is actually the smallest scatterer that we can find. It's uh, uh, because you need a char you need an oscillating charge separation, and the smallest way to achieve that is with uh, with a single dipole. Uh, all right. I want to, uh, uh, with with uh, with that knowledge, I want to shift a little bit from from Rayleigh scattering, that's what we did now, to so-called Rayleigh Gans scattering, and that is a uh, scattering formalism that can be used to describe uh, uh, scattering by particles. So we're going to scale up a little bit from the from the dipole now to uh, to particles. And what better way to start such a thing than with uh, Maxwell's equations? So here we go again. Uh, uh, the equations here now uh, uh, actually uh, written in terms of uh, three uh, quantities. So we have the electric field strength uh, and the magnetic flux density as, well as we're used to. Uh, but I also added the de -electric, de -de electric displacement here in, uh, uh, in two of the equations. Now, is this de -de electric e uh, displacement is uh, is, perpendic is uh, <laughs> proportional? I'm sorry to the uh, to the electric field strength according to this uh, to this relation here. So d is epsilon times uh, times e. Uh, epsilon is the permittivity, uh, and as usual, we can split that into uh, to the permittivity of vacuum, that is uh, the epsilon with a knot, uh, and a relative permittivity that uh, uh, that uh, describes describes it relative to vacuum. So that is uh, valid for a material epsilon r. Uh, the same thing uh, uh, can be done for the uh, permeability uh, mu. Uh, but for most materials, the relative permeability is almost equal to one. So, uh, so mu uh, in most cases is simply set equal to mu zero, the permeability for vacuum. Uh, and then there is a third um, uh, quantity that we uh, that we uh, encountered already uh, earlier on as well, uh, the susceptibility, which is again related to the uh, which is related to the permittivity. Uh, so now we can manipulate a little bit with this uh, electric uh, this electric displacement uh, as epsilon times uh, uh, times the electric field strength. Uh, then we can, in the first step, uh, uh, write uh, the permittivity in terms of its vacuum and uh, relative uh, uh, components. Uh, then we can use the definition of the susceptibility as uh, so uh, one, um, one minus the relative permittivity. So substitute that back, and we have uh, uh, the, thir the third line in the equation. Let's can split split it uh, into epsilon zero times the electric field strength, one term plus epsilon zero times susceptibility times electric field strength. Uh, that completes the fourth line, uh, and then we can assign a new symbol to this uh, to this um, to this last term on the right hand side, uh, p over here. So now we have uh, split. Uh, the electric displacement into two terms, one that is proportional to the vacuum permittivity in the electric field, and one that is has symbol P. Uh, this P is uh, the total induced dipole moment per unit volume. So we're now looking at, uh, at uh, material or, or volume. Uh, uh, for, the, for the single dipole, we could, uh, we could uh, um, define the dipole moment, but now for this material, we, we define so that is the total in, uh, induced dipole moment. So adding all the adding all the dipole moments from all the individual dipoles together, and then uh, average that over volume, so per unit volume. Um, so if if we uh, if you remember back in the in the in the in the previous uh, um, 
you know, before the, before the break, we had uh, the induced dipole moment for a single dipole that was proportional, to, uh, also proportional to the electric field, uh, with this uh, polarizability alpha. Uh, so if you now if you now look at these two equations, that uh, that suggests that there is some kind of relation between between the chi uh, that uh, that uh, occurs in this top uh, equation and the alpha that occurs in this uh, equation for the single dipole. So if we hand wave a little bit, uh, then we, we we could say okay chi. Uh, so the uh, total dipole per unit volume. So that, uh, that means that it will be proportional to the density of dipoles, rho. Uh, if the single dipole has some polarizability alpha, then that will be there as well. Uh, and, uh, and, and due to the, to the top equation, there is some uh, scaling factor with, uh, with vacuum permittivity. Uh, so the rho is introduced because you go from uh, large p to small p. Yes, so we now we now go to uh, from uh, from the properties of a single dipole that is alpha to the properties of a collection to the average of a collection of dipoles, uh, which is chi. Uh, so the density is it. So really, the number density, the number of dipoles per unit volume, is now in there as a as a scaling factor. Um, so, so this this was a little bit hand waving, uh, looking at, looking at the equivalence between the equations and then trying to solve for it. Uh, so it is a simple expression. It holds in in very special cases, but in general, uh, in general, it's not not so easy to scale these things. Uh, so really, a p small p is a microscopic property, really from the from the dipole, uh, and p large p is is a macroscopic property averaged over over a larger volume. So only if the dipoles would be exactly identical with exactly uh, identical polarizabilities, then then this would hold. In general, it's a little bit more complicated, and uh, and uh, chi the susceptibility uh, will simply be a function of uh, of alpha of the alphas, and will be a function of the density uh, in a more in a more uh, complex expression. Um, of course, we uh, when we uh, encountered the susceptibility first, it was uh, when we were looking at uh, Gram's Kronig relations. Um, uh, and there we found that there was a relation uh, between uh, susceptibility and uh, refractive index as well. So uh, if we again look at the uh, complex refractive index, so that is M uh, with a real part uh, and an imaginary part that is proportional to, to absorption, uh, that that relates to the relative permittivity as the square root of, uh, uh, of the relative permittivity, and it uh, relates to the susceptibility as uh, by using the definition of uh, susceptibility. The square root of one plus the susceptibility. Um, it also relates uh, to the uh, the refractive index. Also uh, relates to polarizability, or better formulated better, it's the other way around. For example, if we have a small sphere with a radius uh, with a with a certain radius a, then uh, then the polarizability of that sphere can be written uh, as a function of uh, of the complex refractive index. Uh, that is m there, and as a function of the um, of the volume of the sphere or the radius squared here uh, to, to the third power uh, a, uh, a over there. Um, if you look closely, then uh, it's a little bit small formula, but if you look closely, you can see that there are primes uh, attached to the to the m uh, to the refractive index. Uh, that indicates in this case that uh, that we measure the refractive index relative of the particle. We measure it relative to the refractive index of the medium. Uh, that it is suspended in. So if the if the sphere in this case is uh, suspended in air, then then the refractive in index of the medium is just one, and then nothing really happens. But if it is, for example, floating in water, then uh, then water has its own refractive index as well. So then uh, we take it relative uh, relative to that. Um, in order to uh, to avoid uh, putting primes on uh, on every uh, every time the m occurs, I'm going to drop it now. And, uh, and I'm going to just assume that when we talk about refractive index, uh, then we'll, we'll assume that it is uh, relative to the uh, to the medium. So if the material is uh, if the material we're looking at is suspended in the medium, then it will be relative. Uh, it will be taken relative to that. Keeps the notation a little bit simpler. Okay, so let's go back to uh, to this um, uh, to uh, to Maxwell's equations, uh, and now let's uh, try to include scattering. Uh, so these uh, equations are are completely general. And so, uh, so they would hold for every uh, possible electric field. Uh, so we can also write uh, now in, in the scattering process, we can write the electric field uh, as the sum of the incident field, E0, uh, and the scattered field, uh, E uh, sub uh, C. Uh, so, so also for this total, uh, total field, Maxwell's equations uh, should hold. Uh, 
so let's uh, let's try uh, to see how far we can get. So first, let's write uh, 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 the, the total field as the sum of the uh, incident and scattered fields, uh, and make a little uh, uh, a different decomposition of the um, of the permittivity. So not uh, not yet as a as the vacuum value uh, times a relative uh, term, but uh, but first as uh, as the vacuum value plus uh, a higher order first order higher order term and then a second order etc cetera, etc cetera. and in the end we will be, we will be writing that as uh, as the product of the vacuum and the relative um, uh, uh, relative uh, values uh, now further let's assume that the scattered field uh, is much uh, smaller so the amplitude actually of the scattered field is much smaller than the incident intensity so it is a weak it's very weak scattering uh, and assume that um, uh, that epsilon one, uh, or that, that actually that that occurs when epsilon one, uh, uh, the first order uh, term here, is much smaller than the permittivity of alpha k. Uh, so if that if that holds, then we can neglect all the higher order terms here in the in the sum for epsilon, uh, and we can write uh, uh, epsilon one. Uh, so only retaining epsilon one, we can uh, solve for that uh, as epsilon one is. Um, epsilon zero times uh, the relative coming off from this side minus one. Um, we can divide both sides with uh, epsilon zero and we can then substitute uh, our definition for the refractive index in here. Uh, so we end up with uh, the ratio of these uh, first order and, uh, and vacuum values, epsilon one divided by epsilon zero uh, is the refractive index squared minus one. Uh, so the primes are dropped. Uh, what is also dropped here is the uh, is the fact that that uh, again the refractive index is a function of omega, it's a function of uh, wave number or wavelength or whatever you like. So it is uh, it is not just a constant. Keep that keep that in mind uh, as well. All right. Um, so the usual way of uh, of uh, uh, arriving at wave equations from uh, from Maxwell's equations is uh, is uh, more or less given here. So uh, we take the uh, the outer product of the equation uh, that contains the electric field um, already with the outer product, uh, so both sides of the equation. Uh, then we can uh, substitute uh, uh, the fourth um, uh, the fourth equation here, uh, so that uh, we now have the curl of the curl of the electric field uh, is equal to um, it's a, it's a, let's say proportional to the second derivative of the um, of the electric displacement. Uh, now there is this famous uh, rule for factor geometry that uh, that you can now apply. So the curl of the curl of a factor is uh, equal to uh, to uh, the the, um, uh, the second order. Uh, well, you can you can see it for yourself. It is in um, it is in the uh, EM textbooks. Um, this last term uh, on the right hand side here. Uh, so a nabla inner product with E uh, because E and D are proportional. Uh, uh, we can substitute this uh, this uh, this uh, term here, so this one drops out, becomes zero, uh, and then we end up with this wave equation. This this wave equation uh, for the total electric field now. So uh, nabla squared of e is proportional to the second or uh, second uh, derivative with respect to time of the um, of the electric displacement d over there. Um, so this is for the total field. So the total uh, uh, the, the incident field and the scattered field together. Uh, so what we can now try to do is expand uh, expand this uh, this expression. Uh, so that's uh, that's done in the second line here. So uh, the total field is substituted for the incident field v zero and the scattered field uh, there. It is also done on the right hand side. Uh, so remember that d uh, was equal to epsilon times uh, times e. Uh, so we have two terms on the right hand side as well: epsilon times e zero uh, and epsilon times the scattered uh, scattered field. Uh, now we can manipulate the uh, the terms on the right hand side even further because epsilon was uh, uh, equal to epsilon zero plus epsilon one. So these two terms uh, both uh, split into uh, two, two, two into two terms uh, uh, of their own. Uh, so here in the end we now have um, uh, this uh, th this resulting equation uh, uh, with the incident field and scattered field on both hands uh, on both sides and epsilon zero and epsilon one. Uh, on the right hand side. Um, so if we now inspect uh, inspect these terms, we made a couple of assumption uh, a couple of assumptions uh, earlier on. Uh, then we see that uh, the terms that uh, contain uh, 
uh, zeros, so the incident field E0 and the um, uh, which was much larger than the scattered field in the terms with uh, epsilon zero, which was much larger than epsilon one. These are the strong terms, the dominant terms in this equation. In this equation, um, uh, the, uh, then again, the the scattered field uh, and and uh, the term with the scattered field in epsilon one is is the very weak term because these two were both uh, much smaller than the uh, than the other ones. Uh, and for these terms, uh, let's say uh, they will, they are weak, but we don't know yet. We have epsilon one in there, which is uh, which is a weak term, but epsilon zero is strong. And here it is the other way around. So for these two terms, we don't know yet how it um, how it will uh, end up. Uh, so if you now group uh, according to this uh, to this uh, scheme, uh, so the uh, uh, then strong terms grouped together uh, simply give us uh, give us a, 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 a normal wave equation again, and this is then. Uh, uh, the wave equation that corresponds to the incoming field. Uh, so we can solve that, and then we have an expression for the uh, uh, for the incident field. Um, the first order terms, uh, so the the weak terms, uh, uh, and and, and uh, let's include the very weak term there uh, uh, at this point as well. Uh, that gives us a little bit uh, a more uh, complicated expression. So we have um, uh, from the left hand side we uh, we carry over uh, nabla uh, times the scattered field. Uh, and then we arrange a little bit, so bringing the um, uh, the, the term that contains um, uh, the vacuum primitivity and the scattered field so to the left hand side over there. So this this is again the form of the wave equation as it is for the zero to order. Uh, only now we also have a right hand side uh, that is proportional to epsilon one, and it contains an expression uh, that has the incident field uh, and the scattered field uh, there as well. Um, so basically, if, if we if we paraphrase this a little bit, uh, we have on the left-hand side something that is a function of the scattered field. Uh, or the result will be a function of this. This basically is a function of the scattered field. And on the right-hand side, we have something uh, that is a function of epsilon one times the total field. Um, now the question, uh, if if we want to solve something, if we want to get an uh, get an expression for the uh, for the scattered field itself, uh, then we have to see if somehow we can uh, solve this or rearrange this into uh, the scattered field being expressed as a function of the of the total field. Um, uh, it turns out uh, that uh, this can be done. I'm, uh, I'm just going to give you uh, this uh, this expression as is and spare you the derivation. Uh, it's complicated enough as it is. Uh, so we have here the um, an integral relation. Uh, so on the left hand side is the scattered uh, scattered field, um, uh, and then uh, uh, on the right hand side. Uh, so first we have uh, let let's say we evaluate this uh, scattered field at some distance r from the from the scatterer. Uh, then the field amplitude is going to be inversely proportional to the distance r because we have a uh, spherical outgoing wave. Uh, so that that is familiar. We saw that before. Uh, if we evaluate at a distance r, then it's, that is going to give rise to a phase that corresponds to the distance traveled. Uh, so this term we've seen before as well. Uh, and then, uh, then there is this, uh, this new term that, uh, that we uh, yeah, that basically um, uh, expresses the scattered field in terms of the, of the total field uh, here. Um, we'll, we'll look at the specifics of this equation uh, a little later, but, uh, but it's, it makes sense to compare this to what we uh, what we had before. Uh, so earlier expressions for the uh, scattered field uh, looked uh, more or less like this. We had uh, the incoming field here as a as a constant before the uh, before the expression. Uh, we now have the incident field somewhere hidden in this uh, in this total field. So that is a little bit more complicated. Uh, we have some uh, angular. We had some angular uh, redirection of the light. Uh, well, ang angular stuff is in here as well. With this, uh, this is the scattered wave vector um, uh, appearing twice here. So we have the outer product with, of the scattered wave vector with itself and with the, uh, and with the total uh, total field in the volume. So again, complicated stuff. Uh, the phase term that uh, that uh, that is uh, present in both equations, uh, and then there was uh, some some additional phases that that could be there due to the uh, uh, to the phase um, uh, term of uh, of the of the s function uh, that is going to be hidden in there uh, somewhere as well. Uh, but um, we also know that uh, we have we derived this um, expression relating epsilon one or the 
better the uh, ratio of epsilon one and epsilon zero to the refractive index. So somehow uh, the refractive index, uh, as you can see, epsilon zero is here, epsilon one is here. Uh, so the refractive index goes into this uh, goes into this expression as well. Um, yeah, that part we usually ignore. So let's do that now as well. Uh, okay, so let's uh, um, uh, let's uh, manipulate uh, a little bit further. So uh, uh, first, uh, substitute the epsilon one uh, and epsilon zero. Uh, so, so that gives uh, that gives us uh, m squared uh, minus one. Um, I've now exp I've now accounted for the fact that uh, that the refractive index can vary over the volume. So I've, I've given it a functional dependence on the coordinate r uh, in the volume. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, uh, the wave factor Ks can be uh, can be split into a unit factor S, the unit factor in the S direction, and the magnitude K. Uh, so that allows us to bring uh, uh, the case uh, uh, as uh, scalars in front in front of the um, uh, in front of the uh, uh, of the expression, and then uh, using uh, then use only the unit uh, factors over here. So that is uh, a little bit of manipulation to. Um, uh, to to force uh, uh, to force the expressions more or less in the same um, uh, in, the, in the same format. So let's let's now with with this with this small uh, uh, rearrangement let's uh, let's take a look at, uh, at the terms in this expression. So we have uh, here in green the total field uh, in the scattering volume. Uh, we have uh, something that is related to the uh, we have to no not related it is the local refractive index in the scattering volume um, we have uh, uh, a directional term something that depends on angles something that will depend on, uh, on polarization so the uh, let's say the angular uh, distribution of the scattered light is in there through, in there through this uh, uh, through this uh, double uh, outer product um, and we have uh, and we average all this over the over the volume uh, over the scattering volume. Um, now, if we now look at these uh, terms, so the refractive index is dimensionless. Uh, if we integrate over over the volume here, as this uh, as this integral does, uh, that would add a dimension um, uh, length to the uh, meter to the third, uh, which is countered here uh, in the in the and the expression by k to the third that, uh, that is uh, that is present here. So in the end, uh, electric field here, electric field there, the uh, refractive index is dimensionless. So in the end, uh, uh, the function s uh, as, as given here, so o and s are unit factors in the incident and scattered direction, is a dimensionless function. So basically, it, it more or less uh, serves as the dimensionless function that we had uh, that we had earlier on in the uh, in the in the general expression. Um, now, can we can this be solved? Uh, in some special cases, uh, it, it can actually, and this is uh, one example of the of uh, of that. If we take a very small uh, dielectric sphere, so the radius uh, of the sphere is much much uh, smaller than the wavelength of the illuminating light, uh, then we can uh, actually find an expression for the field uh, uh, for the total field uh, in the sphere, uh, given by this. Uh, uh, this equation here. So the total field in that case is, pro is uh, simply proportional to the uh, uh, to the incident field. Uh, I can plug that in this uh, uh, in this integral equation, and we can further assume, uh, if you now further assume that uh, uh, that that the sphere is so small that uh, that we can consider the uh, epsilon r to be uniform. Um, and that simplifies things a little bit. We can also, if we can also assume that uh, that the particle is so small that that light passing through the particle really does not get a uh, does not get a phase uh, uh, does not get a phase shift and then this uh, exponential term will also uh, evaluate almost to unity so then in that case we can simplify the whole uh, expression um, uh, to uh, to this so a constant uh, that depends on epsilon r v here is now the volume of that very small particle and we still have this uh, small mess uh, of um, uh, of angular components over there um, now I'm going to give you uh, the result of that uh, as well without uh, without proving it uh, because that is also a very tedious uh, uh, exercise. Uh, you can express this uh, this uh, outer product of uh, of s with uh, with s, uh, and then the outer product with the incoming uh, uh, unit factor uh, as, uh, as as given here. So the square root of one minus sine squared theta cosine squared uh, phi, where theta and phi are then the usual scattering angles that uh, that we had before. 
So if you can group that all together, then uh, can write uh, can write an equation for the uh, scattered field. Uh, so now neatly proportional to the uh, incident field, uh, inversely proportional to R because it is a spherical wave, the usual phase term, uh, and then an uh, uh, and then an um, uh, an amplitude uh, term uh, that depends on the uh, uh, on the um, uh, relative primitivity, and then some angular terms uh, that, that of course, will uh, be proportional to the phase function if we uh, would uh, normalize this. Um, uh, well, we wait one, one step too early. We first, we first have to calculate the, uh, the intensity, so we uh, multiply the scattered field with its complex conjugate, uh, and then work out the terms, uh, and end up with this. Uh, then we end up with this equation. Uh, the nice thing about this exercise is that we see all the familiar terms in here that we had also uh, just uh, just um, when we were looking at, at the Rayleigh scattering. We have, uh, of course, an outgoing spherical wave, so it is proportional to uh, inversely proportional, oh, inversely proportional to r squared. Uh, we have um, uh, the wave number to the fourth power, uh, as we saw earlier. Uh, we have uh, uh, proportionality to uh, to the sixth power of the radius, as, as we saw before. Uh, so basically, by by doing it in a slightly different way and making the same assumptions, so very small particles compared to the wavelength, and we get the same result. We just get uh, get back our Rayleigh scattering. Uh, so this is one of the uh, uh, one of the simple uh, one of the yeah, very simple geometries where, where where you can actually solve that integral. Um, but let's uh, let's uh, let's go back um, uh, let's go back. To, uh, to Maxwell's equations uh, and uh, and make an additional assumption. Uh, so the let me, wait, let me go, go a, a few steps back. So the problem with solving uh, uh, the problem with solving this integral is that uh, that you have the total field inside the integral here. So you have uh, you're trying to find an expression for the scattered field um, as a function of uh, of something that contains the scattered scattered field as well. Um, and in this uh, this unique situation, the total field dependent only uh, on the incident field. So then, uh, then that uh, that that circular uh, dependence was lost, and we could solve it. But in the general case, which is now here, uh, uh, that cannot be done. Um, so what we so in order to to to, to get uh, yeah, to to, uh, to do that, uh, the only thing that we uh, the the only option that we have is that uh, that we have to assume that. This very very weak term is is uh, is that weak that we can actually neglect it. Um, so that is uh, that is uh, I think I mentioned uh, the first Born approximation in the previous class as well. This is again a manifestation of the first Born approximation. We will assume that all uh, subvolumes of the of the scattering volume see only the incident intensity. So not as in the integral that we had before the total field. Now they will only see the incident field. Um, yeah, so the so the result is that the field inside the scattering volume uh, becomes equal to the incident field, and only that. Um, well, in that case, uh, we can uh, uh, we can um, uh, write that uh, the, the general uh, equation uh, very simply, see, because we now have uh, the scattered field on the left hand side. Uh, the term is omitted here. Is proportional to the incident field uh, and this s function. Uh, the incident field was here as well, but now only as a as a constant, so they will drop out, and we can write for the for the s function. So basically, this s function, um, uh, the, this this integral expression. Uh, so again, uh, uh, the angular dependence is there, the refractive index is there, and the phase terms are there. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, so uh, but but now but now because of this first Born approximation. The, the circular dependence is gone. Um, this can be written uh, uh, as a, a little bit more compact as uh, as follows. So we uh, we take the, um, uh, the these are just angle dependent terms. These are unit factors that are uh, uh, which are, which are calculated with respect to each other. So so they do not uh, uh, they actually do have no function in within the integral, which is over space. So we can take them out of the integral uh, and then write uh, then define a new factor r that. Uh, uh, that is uh, that is uh, given uh, given here, uh, and as you can see, if you if you substitute this back into uh, into the middle equation, then uh, then you re retrieve uh, uh, the equation on the top. Uh, this uh, this function has a name. It's called the form factor. Uh, so it is 
uh, a volume average. So you integrate over volume and then uh, and then divide by volume, which is volume average of the um, square of the refractive index um, integrated and then uh, or actually uh, yeah, weighted with this uh, with, uh, with with phase terms. Um, so R is then uh, the form factor, the quantity uh, within um, uh, within the integral. So m squared minus one also has a has its own name. It's called the scattering potential. Uh, and uh, uh, the the ref and the refractive index itself is uh, is proportional to uh, to the density distribution inside the tissue. If the, the if the tissue is more dense, then the refractive index will be higher. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm putting this in here because now we have uh, for the for the first time actually some kind of a quantitative link between uh, uh, light scattering and uh, and tissue architecture. So not not not, not in this case not necessarily not necessarily the or, uh, the organization of, of scatterers, but uh, uh, if if you take tissue as this continuous medium, then uh, then it will have a a spatial fluctuation in density that will translate into a spatial fluctuation of the refractive index. Uh, and that will be expressed uh, in the in the form factor, and through the form factor, it will be expressed in the uh, in the scattered uh, field, in the scattered intensity, and then in the scattering uh, properties. In the end, uh, so it is now now a link, linking very complicated link, but it is a link between uh, uh, what goes on in the tissue, uh, for example, a change in density due to disease, for example, uh, and what you can uh, retrieve uh, using a light scattering measurement. Uh, also, if you look close to this equation, you can also see that it is not just a volume integral; it is, uh, it is actually a Fourier transform because of this uh, exponential term over here. Uh, so the form factor is uh, is um, equal to the uh, Fourier transform of this uh, refractive index distribution, or better said, it is equal to the Fourier transform of the scattering potential. Um, now, okay, we can uh, see uh, we can we can make a few approximations again. So let's uh, let's do the familiar one. Let's take a particle uh, with a radius that is much much smaller than the um, than the wavelength. So if the radius is much smaller than the wavelength, then the phase of a wave that travels through the particle will experience almost will almost not change. So the uh, so the phase is k uh, times times uh, times the distance. Uh, k is 2 pi over lambda, so uh, if the distance is equal to the particle radius, uh, and it is much smaller than the uh, than the uh, than the wavelength, then uh, then that the product will be very small. Uh, so in that case, we can uh, we can neglect these exponential terms. So uh, instead of a Fourier transform, we now have a simple uh, simple volume integral. Uh, and somehow my slides are a little bit messed up here because these uh, results were supposed to come in uh, animated and. Uh, and a little bit slower, but uh, uh, I hope you uh, uh, <laughs> I hope you can still follow that we can do some uh, again do some manipulations on that, uh, and then end up again with our familiar results. So first calculate, uh, compare these these two equations, uh, then then um, uh, then calculate the scattered uh, field uh, now with the R in there, uh, and then uh, calculate um, uh, the scattered intensity uh, from that, uh, and then the terms that we end up again have this uh, wavelength to the fourth power uh, and diameter to the sixth power. So again, we have uh, uh, we have Rayleigh scattering. Uh, and, and if we, if we could, would go to the trouble of uh, actually calculating the scattering coefficient, uh, scattering cross section from that, uh, then we get uh, that that result that um, that looks uh, very similar to what we had uh, before the break. So um, this whole derivation is basically. Um kind of a proof of uh, what we already knew yeah so the yeah but the, 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 there's one uh, yeah yeah more or less but, but in both uh, both so so, uh, so the what we did before the break was exact that was uh, there was no uh, there were no approximations in there uh, but for the uh, so so then then we uh, the, then then afterwards we used maxwell's equations and got that complicated integral with the total field in there mm -hmm. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, approximation was okay. When that, um, uh, when that, that, when that particle is very small, then uh, then we can actually find an expression for the total field, uh, and then got uh, got uh, got that result. And now we're going the other way. Now, we, now we already uh, made an assumption for the uh, that that the total field is equal to the incident field, the Born approximation, uh, and then an additional assumption here that uh, that we can neglect the phase differences because the particle is small, and then we get the same result. So it is, and uh, 
and that assumption, uh, the born uh, approximation, um, is that valid in uh, human tissue? Yeah, that is. Uh, yeah, you can. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, usually not 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 necessarily always, but. Uh, um, but it is often used. Yeah, it is very often used, and uh, yeah, I, I think I think you can say it's almost. Um, it's it's uh, it's all, no, it's not universally valid, but it's it's very. Um, it's it's. Okay. Um, you're, you, yeah. you can you can safely do that. Yeah, and so now we are uh, we landed on Rayleigh scattering, um, but not yet on the uh, on the uh, Gans um, edition. Right? Yeah, no, no. This is no. So the Rayleigh scattering. Uh, actually, yeah, this, no. Let, let's okay. Let's uh, <laughs> let's say that uh, we reserve Rayleigh scattering for the dipole and for the very very small particle. So let's call this. Let's keep calling this Rayleigh scattering. Mm -hmm. uh, and now for the Rayleigh Gans, um, uh, we're going to allow the particle to be a little bit bigger. Uh, okay. So that so that means that, that the phase differences cannot be uh, can that. So basically, that that a wave travels longer than a wavelength through the particle. Uh, so then you're not allowed to neglect these phases anymore, and then the, then this uh, top integral becomes a Fourier transform again. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, so you can, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly what I said. Uh, uh, so you can, you can uh, uh, now calculate form factors for uh, for spheres or cylinders or disks. Uh, but uh, the, yeah, the, the drawback is that you cannot uh, neglect uh, the phase difference anymore. Uh, actually, uh, for the sphere, uh, you've already seen that before, in, uh, or more or less before in your uh, assignment, uh, because uh, now you can uh, take that Fourier transform and carry it out in spherical coordinates. Uh, and if the refractive index um, does not have a distribution, but is simply a constant. Uh, then it will appear in front of that uh, uh, of that uh, of that Fourier integral, and then um, uh, yeah, and then you can you can do the calculation just as in the assignment and uh, have this uh, have this uh, this um, uh, this form uh, come out in spherical coordinates, uh, where Q again is the uh, is the scattering factor two times k times sine theta over uh, sine of half theta. Um, if you have the, if you have the form factor, you can calculate the scattered intensity. Uh, from that, you can calculate the scattering uh, cross section. So just uh, uh, just to show how that then, how that then looks like in the um, uh, in the Rayleigh Gans approximation, um, uh, we have uh, the, the the usual terms. So again, uh, k to the fourth power, radius to the to the sixth power, uh, and then some um, uh, some angular stuff that uh, that depends on the uh, uh, on the for form factor itself. Um, so this, uh, so the, the, the the top equation here is the form factor for um, uh, for a sphere. But uh, you can also, and I blatantly stole this from a book, uh, you can also calculate the form factor for uh, for rods or discs or, uh, or other discs apparently, and uh, uh, and that, that's the one for spheres again. Uh, uh, so, so basically, for these kind of shapes, you can uh, you can calculate the form factor, and then and then from that you can calculate the um, uh, the scattering cross section for these um, uh, for these types of particles. Um, so, what I want to do uh, before uh, before we have a, a short break again is uh, is uh, briefly compare now this uh, this form factor to to the other factor that we encountered, uh, the structure factor. So, I've put the two equations here. Um, uh, side by side, uh, as you can see, both are integral equations. Uh, both are Fourier transforms, uh, so the symbols are not exactly matched here. But uh, uh, I guess you will appreciate uh, the, um, uh, the similarity with that. Uh, and what both functions actually do is uh, accumulate phase differences uh, uh, of scattered fields, or fieldlets, or field components uh, over the measurement volume. So, uh, on a particle level. Uh, Rayleigh Gans uh, uh, scattering basically uh, 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 describes uh, a particle as a, as a collection of dipoles, as a volume distribution of dipoles. Uh, each of the di each of these dipoles will radiate an, uh, uh, an outgoing spherical we uh, wave according to the according to Rayleigh uh, uh, to Rayleigh scattering. Uh, but because these dipoles are positioned at different locations uh, in the in the in the overall particle, they will all contribute with a different phase. Uh, and this form factor is the function that that accounts for that. So that accounts for all these again, all these interferences between the different phases. Now, in this case, of the of the dipole. Uh, so these are just the same equations that we had uh, on the previous slide, but that uh, 
that make it a little bit more explicit. So that what that that is on this particle level, and then uh, now scaling up to uh, to tissue for the for the structure factor. Uh, so if we now have a bunch of these particles, so let's say these are spherical particles, uh, if if we now have a bunch of them in a volume, uh, then uh, then we can first calculate the total scattered field from that from that one particle, uh, and then uh, and then uh, and then uh, after that for the collection of particles, and we had there the uh, structure factor that accounted. Uh, for the phase differences between these di between these different uh, uh, particles, um, so basically going from uh, from from microscopic to microscopic, uh, we, uh, we 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 in, in this Rayleigh Gans approximation we start off with we start off with uh, dipole scattering. Uh, we then describe a particle as being uh, as, be, uh, as as just the volume distribution of of all these dipoles. Uh, and then taking the Fourier transform of the scattering potential gives us the form factor uh, that allows us to calculate the scattering of uh, of of of, the, of that particle, of that uh, particle that is uh, made up of dipoles. And then if we put a bunch of these particles in uh, uh, in a volume, uh, then we can calculate the total scattered field from that from that volume uh, uh, through the structure factor uh, as, the, as the pair correlation uh, as the Fourier transform of the pair correlation function. So it is a it is kind of a, a symmetric uh, or equivalent way of of scaling up. So you have this uh, you have this elemental scatterer, the dipole. Uh, your particle is made up of a bunch of these dipoles that each have their own uh, ampl amplitude and phase. Uh, using the form factor, yeah, you, you you account for all these phases and all the interferences that may occur between these phases, and you end up with a scattered field of one particle. And then on an uh, on a higher level, um, you, you can take the uh, scattered um, uh, field amplitude and phase of a particle uh, and then account for all the uh, phases of all the particles and the interferences between the phases of all these particles through the, through the structure factor. Um, all right, uh, this, is, uh, this is the slide that uh, signifies that it's time for a break. Um, shall we start again at uh, quarter two? Yeah, sure. That was quite well timed. Exactly 45 minutes uh, till the next break. First time, lucky day, lucky break. <laughs>